session 11 of series 10 um, and my name is Sue MacDonald and I'm the curator for the Maternity and Midwifery Hour and the Maternity and Midwifery Festivals and it's my pleasure to be chairing this evening. I've got two wonderful guests, um, Kate Greenstock and Sarah Mills who are with us and because we're mean to them before they've even got time to breathe we're going to ask them to share their moment of the week and I know they have a good one, both of them. So who's going to be first? Is it going to be Kate? I can go first. Hello, everyone. I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> um, mine's a bit nerdy and midwifery focused, actually, but it was exciting. So I got to sit uh, yesterday with a bunch of midwife researchers and also a psychologist, obstetrician and a lawyer, all thinking about the emotional landscape of midwifery. And we invited Billy Hunter along. She couldn't come because she wasn't well. Oh. But we got to watch a presentation from her and, and just, oh, you know, note how we're sitting on the shoulders of giants. Fabulous. And giants yourself, actually. Fabulous. Thank you for sharing that. I don't think that's nerdy at all. I think that's really exciting. A bit nerdy. Wonderful. <laughs> nah, nah. How about Sarah? Can you better um, that one? Oh, my highlight of the week is also kind of midwifery related. We had a guest speaker come to a school away day and uh, I took one look at her and realised that she was one of my case holding women when I was a student midwife 17 years ago, which was lovely. So I'd supported her all through her pregnancy, her labour and birth and saw her in the postnatal period. And all of a sudden, all these memories just came back to me and it, it was oh, wow. beautiful. We had a very emotional moment. <laughs> I have to say, Sarah, you're, that's a very good advert for con continuity of care and case Definitely. loading, which is very much on my brain from the festival yesterday. But also, I noticed you did tweet something about it too. I did. As a I can share, I'm a tweeter. <laughs> that's great. Okay, well, and that's lovely. That really is lovely, isn't it? That's, the, that's really what you both described as the breadth of what you can do within midwifery in a day. Isn't yeah, it? it's lovely, lovely. Thank you so much. Well, I'll just do a little spiel, my little spiel of just reminding people. Now, I know we've got our old favourite. No, I shouldn't say old favourites. We have our regular people. So welcome to you. But I know we'll have some new people. So welcome to you as well. And just to share with you where we, we started, because this maternity and midwifery hour emerged from the pandemic. And I always think that there are some good things that came out of the pandemic and some things we should keep. We've obviously kept the maternity and midwifery hour um, and we should keep some of the other things. But we, we can explore that maybe next series. I think it's time we did revisit some of that. Anyway, the story started because obviously midwives, student midwives, nurse, well, everybody in the health service, actually, and that's also very close to my heart today, couldn't go to face-to-face -face events, couldn't go to seminars, couldn't do study days, couldn't do anything. And yet there was a need for people to connect and there was a need for continuing professional development and information. And when we first started, we had a lot about COVID because obviously people needed to know about COVID-19 and you know how people were dealing with it. And what was very striking in those days was the the sort of things that midwives and maternity services were doing were fantastic. And that's why I say we should keep some of the things like the wobble rooms. I don't know if Kate and, and Sarah will talk anything about those, but some of the things we seem to have kind of covered over a bit now and we're not using anymore, but actually they were very useful things. And I was struck by, we had a lot of midwives and heads of service talking and I was struck by the efforts that were made to make sure women and babies and families got the best possible care and midwives could work around as much as possible to make sure they were cared for well. And also actually educationalists, because that the whole COVID impacted student midwives, I, I would want to say terribly, but immensely. And educators had to work very hard to try and catch up in places and make sure their experience was was garnered properly so respect actually and it's a good time on the NHS's birthday to say hey what a fantastic bunch of people work in maternity and midwifery services absolutely fantastic and thank you to all of you for all the things you're doing and also and I know that Sarah I know that Sarah and Kate are going to do this I'm sure they're going to emphasize we need to look after ourselves as well and remember 
our own needs and mind well-being mental well-being in all of this as well at this time because it's it's stressful time it's always a stressful time and i think midwives are fantastic and the way they deal with it now i'm going to do a quick switch through news because for me the biggest news was yesterday the manchester festival which was lovely apart from this now a lovely midwife called amanda hutcherson is doing some getting people knitting because that's one of the things we're very much associated in our history of knitting, sitting in a corner knitting while we're observing and listening and all the things that we do as midwives. And she gave me some bubbles wool and I've got to knit and I haven't knitted for a million years. So I'm going to undertake that next week I shall bring a square. It might be a little ratty square when I finish with it. From my previous experience but that's one of the things that came from the festival the other thing we had some fantastic presentations if you didn't register you need to make sure you register for the festivals because you get a box set and you can dip in and the, the you would not want to miss we had trixie mackery talking about the sort of nuts and bolts of continuity of care we had jenny hall saying use it or lose it continuity of care and was that touched my heart hugely. It was fantastic. We had Rebecca Sobadu, Sobadu, who was talking about racism and what the RCM are doing to address racism and things like race to lunch, which is, sounds fantastic. And Elaine Hanzak, who was talking about mental, perinatal mental health and the impact of when a, a, a mum has a problem with her mental health after that she's had a baby and the long-term implications of that and what midwives can do. It was really inspiring. And the other inspiring thing, of course, was meeting those wonderful, mostly Manchester midwives or North, Northern midwives who were so warm and attentive and the questions they came up with fantastic. And they were just, it felt like being given a big hug. And this is what I love about face-to-face -face festivals. So if you haven't been to one of the festivals, you need to book in. There's one in Cardiff, there's one in Edinburgh, Cardiff is in September, Edinburgh is in November, and London, if you're at London base, in January or February sometime. So oh, that was all in a breathless thing. And of course, it's the 75th birthday of the NHS today. And the, everything's been very full of a celebration of the NHS, but also concern about where we're going. About And somebody was saying, will we be here in 25 years time? And I'm thinking we really need to be here in 25 years. We need more investment and more midwives and more, more doctors, more everything. We need lots of things and we need to address the slide down that's happened over the last few years because it's such an important part of our lives. And I think that's really impacted when I've listened to the radio today and I've read um, journals and, and Twitter, it's really hit me today, very much so. Also, the RCOG, this is completely different, the RC, RCOG has just released new guidelines on the management of nausea and vomiting in pregnancy and hyperemesis gravidarum, and they're calling for feedback. Now, that reminds me that you've got some lovely resources that go alongside this session. Kate and Sarah both given some super reading for you bedtime reading actually it might take a bit more than bedtime you might go into the weekend with it but also we've got the guidelines so you've got a link to go to that so for oh, I've, I've i've done that i've got to 10 past seven just in time to introduce my lovely two speakers now this is really the opportunity to explore something that's very under researched and we we kind of might know about but it hasn't been properly formally researched or gathered in, a, in a, um, an analytical way. This is the phenomena of midwives and student midwives themselves giving birth and people who've, who've given birth and then become midwives. And, and we know it has an impact on you, which could be good, it could be not so good. And this is, we're going to look about how positive and negative influences can inform your practice or actually make you more vulnerable to repeat a trauma if you've had a very traumatic time. So we're going to look at strategies, strategies in midwifery education for preparation and trauma-aware structures and how to support midwives and student midwives who are preparing to give birth 
um, or also who, those of you, those of them who may have had a traumatic birth, how they can be supported in practice. So I'm going to introduce both our speakers together because they're going to do a kind of double act. Um, and that's very much in their way of thinking because that, that's that's the way they function. So we've got Kane, Kate Greenstock, who's been with us before, who's a midwife coach facilitator. She lives in London and she works within a continuity of care team. And she's also a coach and supports midwives and mothers. And I love this to creatively reimagine their work lives. And don't we need that now? Don't we just need that? She's been all over the world. And she loves the fact we all see the world from different angles. Um, and she's obviously looking after uh, newborn families. She's a skilled facilitator of groups. She's got an MA in modern history, Dip HE in antenatal education, and a BSA honours in midwifery. And she's just published a very delicious book. Now it's somewhere in my on my desk. Here it is. Flourish. Cracking good read. It's a very good read that you have to take your time in, I would say. But you'll you'll get a little flavour of that from Kate today. And then also we have Sarah Milnes, who's a practising midwife since 2006. She's worked as a rotational midwife, providing universal care in all areas of midwifery. She's worked in the a midwifery research team. She's completed the newborn and physical examination newborn. Uh, and she's also a lecturer now at, in midwifery at the University of Leicester. She's also associate fellow of the Higher Education Academy and is studying a master's degree in advanced midwifery practice at Angela Ruskin. And so welcome to Sarah and to Kate. The screen is now yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, wonderful to be here everyone and uh, you'll get an impression we'll introduce ourselves again in a minute just to add a few little details but i think the key thing about sarah and myself doing this together was that we're coming from different perspectives um with at the moment sarah working as a lecturer and doing research she's done research in this area myself um as a, a practicing midwife working in the nhs at the moment but also me having trained as a midwife in my 40s, having had three children, and Sarah and I were discussing it, Sarah having started as a midwife before she had her two children. So we were exploring the different angles that that might bring to the session as well, um, and keen to raise more questions probably this evening than we have answers, which is probably the measure of a good question or a good theme that we we end up with more questions but we really want to be able to present what we know already which is very little actually um and then begin to ask questions around it which i'm sure many of you will have thoughts about some of you will have come into this evening having trained as a midwife and then become a parent some of you will have been a parent and then trained as a midwife um, and so your perspectives will be incredibly valuable, your personal perspectives on this topic. So um, I, I can't actually see the slides as they go through, uh, but that's fine. I will just, I'll just, we'll just move them on. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself. And thank you, Sarah. So there's the, there's the first slide just with our names and our contact details on there. And um, you've heard from Sue, mostly, who I am. Um, I think she said all of that. And that picture is actually uh, me during deep COVID, that second wave, the Delta wave in January um, 2021. Uh, on my son's 18th birthday after a night shift where I'd welcomed this little boy, shared with permission into the world. And the reason I've chosen that picture is it represents the motivation for writing the book, which is all about expressing the psychological realities of midwifery. So I'm going to let Sarah introduce herself. So this is me. Um, so I uh, spent 13 years as a midwife at Leicester Royal Infirmary and then left um, four years ago to come into full-time teaching. And I love it. I love teaching students. It's my passion. Um, it's definitely where, you know, I, I see my path going. Um, 
when undertaking my master's back in back in COVID, so trying to do a master's whilst homeschooling and working full time, which was kind of tricky, um, I became really interested in birth trauma and uh, vicarious trauma that midwives get from witnessing trauma in practice, and also the the trauma that they bring with them as they enter the maternity services as a student midwife. So that's how me and Kate kind of got together and um, ended up on here tonight. Yeah, we actually met at the uh, Maternity Midwifery Festival in Leicester, didn't we? The Midlands Yes, one. it in was May. actually one of my students who spoke to Kate and said, you need to come and meet Kate because she's interested in your research and you're talking about the same things and you need to get together. So that was brilliant. Look how this happens. It's amazing. <laughs> How you can form these these connections so quickly so um just to give you a bit of context about the book because um flourish talks about what i've called the five mega mountains of midwifery you can see them on the screen there um, moral injury compassion fatigue burnout trauma exposure and ptsi as those big themes the things that we encounter in midwifery the emotional landscape as it were and um I started to ask questions about not only vicarious trauma or secondary trauma, how midwives are being uh, exposed to trauma via their work, our work, but also what does it mean to be experiencing personal trauma and possibly birth trauma in the context of already having been exposed in a mid midwifery environment. Um, so one of the chapters in the book is about midwives as people who also give birth. So it kind of inspired all this thinking, which um, already since the publication, I've discovered more. So there'll be lots in the second edition that will definitely be an updated chapter. So um, what I discovered and what I saw as I wrote the book was that um, midwives were walking around saying, I'm not cut out for this. Uh, I'm too old or too tired or too sensitive for this work. And what I knew having done the research was actually happening was that there was unacknowledged traumatic stress. And that was the context for how midwives were feeling and particularly in COVID, very shut down from ourselves and, and sometimes from each other as well, just trying to get through. But this unacknowledged traumatic stress um, in the context of when midwives give birth can obviously lead to more stress, compound stress and trauma as a result of not really having looked at it. So the book explores trauma exposure and reflects on the fact that the fact that not all events that are perceived to be traumatic are objectively severe in their nature. So as in we might not consider something to be traumatic but actually it is for that person and of course that's true for pregnant and birthing women and people but it's also true for midwives and midwives are exposed ongoing to trauma so it's not just about those events that we would say are classically um, trauma inducing but just being involved in difficult lives that the families we encounter and, and, and what they have to go through in their lives, hearing from each other about traumatic events or situations, even if we weren't involved. And then, of course, witnessing or supporting colleagues who are currently suffering, whether that's midwifery related suffering or life related suffering as well. So all of those things hold grains of trauma exposure possibility and then of course there are also the big events so why look at when midwives give birth i love this quote from um, maya angelou from her book i know why the cage bird sings there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you and as i wrote the book i, I really had a sense that um, midwives have a uh, deeply untold story. Um, many of us have experienced things that we have packaged up and put aside, maybe talked to a few colleagues about, but we've never really had many of us the psychological support to allow that story to be told. And I was very aware that uh, our workforce, uh, the midwifery workforce is, is getting younger. So there are more 18 year olds and that sort of age group being trained uh, and educated in midwifery. 
and very aware therefore that the childbearing population are they're more likely to have been affected as a younger person as a midwife by all of this and this was what triggered my interest in this area it was a scoping review of maternity care providers experience of primary trauma um, this is Lisa Chalmer and her colleagues um, in the Gold Coast in Australia, published in 2021. And they looked at 352 relevant studies and found absolutely nothing written about it. And that shocked me at the time. And I thought, how could that be that we are not thinking about the impact on midwives as they go through this vulnerable time of life and are exposed potentially to primary trauma for a second time. So the disconnects in our thinking um, seem to be these. What on earth is happening that we are not focusing on the emotional health of this large female midwifery workforce? That's the first question, right? Even without the second half of that sentence, why is there an absence of focus on our emotional health? Um, second part of that sen sentence, the majority of this workforce will experience this enormous transition during or before their time as a midwife. And also, what, what's going on that we're not linking, obviously, the emotional health of midwives with the emotional health of women? Now, of course, some researchers have done that. Um, Jenny Patterson, for example, and her team um, from Edinburgh Napier have talked about the impact of care providers, um, emotional landscape and the way in which it impacts on women. But specifically around a midwife's experience of giving birth and their experience of midwifery and how it leads to the impact on their birthing experience at this point hadn't been written about. So profound disconnects and a gap in our knowledge as well. Um, so uh, the, the next slide shows a picture of a health professional there, these lovely images drawn by my gorgeous illustrator, Joe Bradshaw, but this shows a, a defeated health professional. And the, um, the quote here is from Lisa Chama and her colleague's study saying primary trauma personally, personally experienced by uh, maternity care providers during their childbirthing journey is not discussed in the literature. It's feasible to assume that there'd be a significant number of those MCPs as participants in those broader stu studies about birth trauma, but this is not evident to date. This would suggest that a substantial number of midwives, obstetricians, etc., suffer primary trauma leading to PTSD from their birth trauma, but it's unknown and then return to the clinical setting. And obviously that was one of my primary concerns as I wrote the book, that there is not just uh, the period of uh, pregnancy and anxiety in pregnancy, which brings midwife, midwives to this place of making decisions about their births and about their breastfeeding journeys, but also what does it mean to be returning to the clinical setting with all of that background that you're bringing with you. So, um, yeah, questions around um, maternity care providers experiencing PTSD. Is that what is that what's happening? Um, and what's happening when we come back into the clinical setting? Are we being exposed to subsequent trauma events? And you know, having seen anecdotally colleagues coming back from maternity leave and being expected on labour ward to go back into the room where they've experienced personal trauma themselves. Um, you know, there, there are many ways in which we could prepare for that experience, but then soften it um, live in the moment when people return from maternity leave. So we're going to offer up some suggestions, but also ask you for your opinions in a bit. So a few mind-blowing thoughts. Um, we don't know whether a midwife is more or less likely to experience personal birth, birth trauma than a non-midwife. Um, the most recent Australian study, which was uh, 2019, around birth trauma, not specifically around midwives, but it did break down the numbers and it said that 93% of midwives had experienced 
trauma. It was a small study, 249 people. Um, and within their professional lives, they broke it down like this. 85% had experienced trauma in their professional lives and 41% had experienced trauma in their own birth. So similar numbers at 41% to the ones that um, Sheen and Speedy and Slade have always quoted around 30%. So 30% of childbearing women are experiencing perinatal trauma. So presumably, we can only assume that at least 30% of midwives may be carrying an experience of trauma back into the workplace. And that may then create this opportunity for compound trauma. So in addition to this, we know that um, women who are from Black, Asian and mixed ethnicity backgrounds are more likely to die in the perinatal period. And we know that they're twice to three times as likely to have a baby who dies in the womb or after birth. And they're more likely to experience care as traumatic, absolutely, because of previous experiences of trauma and of marginalization in healthcare. Um, none of us need more evidence of that. But what we're needing to do is to pay more attention to those layers of trauma amongst these groups of colleagues and thinking about what does it mean to be a black Asian or mixed ethnicity woman who's also a midwife who already has more ex exposure and vulnerability to exposure to trauma and then on top of that we're not really doing the work the psychological work to um, enable people to tell their stories to get the support that they need and then um, to be able to reach out in this period of vulnerability in pregnancy and after the birth itself before a return to the clinical setting. So this study, um, I was again golden moment on Twitter pointed to this when I raised the question on Twitter around when midwives give birth and um, Sharon um, Stolia and Hannah Dahl and Andrew Sheehan, so Sharon's in Australia as well and they've done an integrative review so post the one that Lisa Chalmer had done of midwives personal childbearing bearing experiences and they used 20 articles that some of which date back some time and what they have noted from this review is that uh, we need to acknowledge the woman within the professional midwife and the professional midwife within the woman they've said actually even what we've looked at even these 20 um, articles, these 20 papers that we've looked at are provide a, a limited research, research base and within them there's quite a lot of anecdotal evidence. So they're saying we need to do more work on this, we need to do more research to really understand midwives' own experiences of birth and then the way our experiences impact practice. What they found is that midwives felt dismissed, um, that midwives experienced higher fears and anxieties in pregnancy, um, possibly even higher than another woman who isn't a midwife because it was being heightened by that professional knowledge. But the mismatch between that and how they were regarded uh, and listened to was huge. Um, and they've pulled out the work of Sarah Church here um, and also Redwood there which is an older piece of work in 2008. But that was co a common theme that midwives who are pregnant have strong fears and anxieties um, and the professional knowledge plays into that. They also found that uh, midwives were questioning their previous assumptions about birth and breastfeeding. This is such a striking uh, quote here. <clears throat> How could I, how could I have stood beside those women? So many of them calming, breathing, murmuring, you can do it, you're doing it. Letting them trust me. I knew nothing. I didn't deserve their trust. A midwife de described the veil of illusion about birth being torn away as she, in this case, experienced it herself and then started questioning, oh my goodness, what have, what have I been doing? without having experienced this. And I know this is a contentious issue and I know that there are midwives who have not experienced birth or breastfeeding, et cetera, and that's absolutely fine. 
um, but we've paid a little attention to those who have. There is also that question of trauma more broadly. Um, and in this um, Sharon Stilia study, in six of the 20 articles, midwives are reporting feeling traumatized and having flashbacks and nightmares and panic attacks, sometimes for prolonged periods of time. Um, you can imagine what the main causes of those were, they're described there. And we know that there's an increased risk post-traumatic experience of um, PTSD developing, or PTSI, injury as I call it in the book. Um, but we, we know also that or at least we can assume, we're making assumptions here, that midwives who have been pre-traumatized by their midwifery experience and then go on to experience a, a difficult birth, a traumatic birth, are in an increased risk group for developing PTS, PTSI themselves. That makes logical sense, doesn't it? But the, the research work still needs to be done to really ascertain whether that's true. And then um, I had a chat with the Loveler lovely Anna Maidley, who's um, doing her research, her PhD research uh, with the Open University. Uh, I think she's actually being supervised by Sarah Church, who we just mentioned. And um, she's been exploring women's experiences of making non-normative choices in childbirth. She's not yet published, um, but she very generously shared some of the findings with me. And out of her 13 interviewees, six of them were midwives. Um, and she has noted that yes, those midwives have been affected by secondary trauma, so witnessing trauma being part of it, but not obviously in their own bodies, but they are making, as a result, non-normative choices, so away from those pathways, which we might assume to be the normal ones, um, for their own pregnancies and births. And sometimes that includes, and Sarah's got an example of this as well, choosing cesarean birth. And that serves the purpose of defending or expressing their reproductive identity. So this is one of the things that, one of the themes in her work, talking about defense or expression of reproductive identity and how complicated that is. The relationship between midwife identity and reproductive identity, so intertwined um, and midwives sometimes finding it difficult to separate those two and that, uh, sometimes creating further anxiety or difficulty over choices, trying to step away from the normative solution. And that might be, and Anna raised this point as well, further complicated by raised expectations from others of people who are already midwives and sometimes created by ourselves because um, there's a raised expectation, particularly via social media around how birth will happen what breastfeeding looks like, what infant feeding choices you're going to make, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously people's lives are more visible if we choose to make them so, and that can create another dimension and complication. So Sarah's going to um, tell us all about her work, about um, mothers becoming midwives, so mothers training in midwifery. So yeah, part of my, uh, well, my master's dissertation research was about um, the reason why uh, student midwives who've already had children then go on to do their training. And with most of the people that I spoke to, their own personal experience was a catalyst for them wanting to come into the midwifery profession. And this was either because they had a really positive experience, they wanted to emulate and share with other people, or because they had a negative experience and actually they didn't want anybody else to go through the experience that they went through. Now, this can be a good or a bad thing. Um, so what I found that it didn't um, affect their philosophy of care and what they wanted for women, but actually um, when they went back into the environment where they may have had their baby or a similar environment to where they had their baby, it brought back very significant and strong and unexpected memories. So a lot of the students that I interviewed actually had a very negative time as part of their own uh, pregnancy journey. Um, and they experienced the trauma that Kate was discussing earlier. 
So I've got a couple of quotes to share with you. So one student said um, one of their first births, they didn't really know anything. They felt really out of control. And that's an ongoing theme with trauma. It's, it's a lack of control, lack of choice, lack of compassionate care. Uh, one, mid, uh, one student midwife said that it wasn't her body that was traumatized. She got a healthy baby, she had a healthy outcome, but actually it was her mind that was traumatized. And often what you'll find is that you know, it, it's not the big catastrophic negative experiences that women have that leave them with trauma. It is, it's the vulnerability that they feel. It's the lack of control, lack of perceived compassionate care. <clears throat> so, like I said, the majority of students experienced unexpected flashbacks when they went back onto clinical placement. Um, so one student went into the antenatal clinic and she had a flashback because it was where she was told that her child had significant uh, congenital um, abnormalities and all of a sudden all those memories came back to her when she was in that place and she didn't realise that was going to happen to her. There was one student that said that she was caring for a woman who really lost control and that really reminded her of herself and how she felt when she was going through her own childbirth experience. And there was one student who literally had to leave um, her placement experience because she went into a cesarean section and what she saw was exactly what she went through and it upset her so much that she had to walk away. She couldn't do anything more than get very emotional and cry and leave because although she wasn't expecting it, putting her back in that situation just gave her all of these emotive feelings. And then this, uh, the student in, in the red writing, I mean, this student is all for physiological birth. She's very passionate about physiological birth, but because she experienced herself a postpartum hemorrhage, she finds it very, very difficult to be able to sit on her hands and wait for a physiological third stage. She's only happy when the placenta's out and, and, and the, the blood loss is minimal. So even though she has all of you know, this, this faith in childbirth in the back of her mind, she's constantly thinking, I just want the third stage to be over. She was also left quite traumatized by her own birth and it does impact women for a long time. And it has a wider public health impact so it affects so when she goes for a smear test it can affect women engaging with services so it's not just in terms of having a baby and, and their future reproductive choices or if they go in and they're then caring for women based on their own trauma it can actually have long-term implications for women's health one of the things the students also said was that they found that childbirth is very medicalized nowadays which we know and I think one of the things we do as educators is we teach them the, the physiology, the, the, the normal, what, what we should expect. And, and that's really important to teach them the physiology of, of pregnancy and childbirth, because if they understand the physiology, they then know when things are going wrong. They might not know what it is, but they know that they need to intervene in some way. But one of the issues with teaching them the physiology in the first year is that we then put them in the lion's den when we send them to labor ward. So in an ideal world, we would want to send all of our students to a home birth team or to a birth centre in the first year. And they would see, you know, how the body is able to labour. But instead, we put them on a very complex environment with women with additional needs. And it does have a profound effect on their philosophy about childbirth. And when you are, when you're shown one way of how things work, that then becomes you as a person because that's all you ever see and so it's really difficult as an educationalist to then be able to speak to the students and teach them in a different way what the students also said as part of my research was that they thought they would benefit from a debrief service because what they wanted to do was disassociate their own experience from what they see in clinical practice because everybody's birth is unique to them what you have been through yourself you you cannot see in anybody else and that's why we always say you don't have to have had a baby to be a midwife you just have to be empathetic and understand that person's journey um so one of the things that came out of it was that it, i think it would be really important to be able to speak to students when they come into 
uh, the midwifery, educa midwifery education to be able to say, okay, well, this was your experience, but that's not anybody else's experience. So what you went through, you need to separate yourself from that. Otherwise, it can have an impact on the care that you provide to women. So when I was doing my background research, uh, I found that there wasn't an awful lot at all to do with student midwives and how they, you know, how their experience affects them going forward uh, in their in their career. So I had to do a little bit of wider reading. And what I did find was that there, there is a little bit of research around breastfeeding and midwives who have a positive personal experience of breastfeeding are more willing to offer support to women. Midwives who hadn't had any children of their, uh, of their own just followed the hospital guidelines quite strictly, which is um, obviously BFI friendly. Uh, midwives who formula fed their babies um, were quite happy and more willing to offer a supplementation rather than um, support women with breastfeeding, which is really interesting. Um, a couple of studies found that people who were raised uh, seeing their mother's breastfeed and their family's breastfeed, they had stronger beliefs around the benefits of breastfeeding. So these kind of demonstrate how healthcare providers naturally draw on their own experience. Uh, when providing care and, and the choices that they offer to women. And I think this is really important when we're examining midwives that have either experienced trauma themselves or they've seen very traumatic experiences that have stayed with them. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, so we've formulated some discussion points um, which are going to get pulled into the chat so that you guys can reflect on them as well and maybe formulate your own questions from them um, and I just want to go through them one by one just because it gives us a chance all to think and it might stimulate something for you so we're thinking based on what Sarah has said on how can midwifery education providers take a crucial role to facilitate that reflection so not just uh, this could make a difference to how you practice your personal experience but also what would reflection, true reflection look like on our birth, our parenting or our infant feeding journeys for those of us who are already mothers or fathers as we come into the midwifery education journey? Um, and there are great ways to do that, um, at, you know, true reflection, whether it's uh, written or indeed more verbal ways to reflect, but some sort of psych psychological support that really gently and slowly unpacks those experiences, personal experiences, so that we're more aware of them, but also um, can be more aware how what kind of influence they might have and where we see those clashes in practice. And that really, really helps um, those reflections to disassociate, as Sarah was saying, or to distance ourselves from between our journey and the journey of those people we're caring for it makes an enormous difference. How might maternity employers support a pregnant midwife to prepare for birth, feeding or parenting by offering psychological support to unravel the stories that they have experienced in practice? Um, what an amazing thing that would be, right? And what an important thing to say, I'm going to support this employee who's going through this enormous transition themselves to say, we have exposed you, you have been exposed in practice to all of this. How can we help you unravel that before you go on your own personal journey? And how might maternity systems use the rich opportunity during and after maternity leave, not just for healing, but also for growth? And, and by growth, here we mean what would supported reflection for midwives be able to cre create in terms of midwives integrating their own experiences and then deepening and making richer their care their practice as a midwife so do you see that's one step on yes absolutely healing particularly if they've had a traumatic experience themselves um, and possibly compound trauma from their previous experiences of trauma in the workplace, but also what would growth look like? How would we make the most of these learnings and then reintegrate them back into practice? So we'd love you to have a look at those questions in the chat and make some comments, ask some more questions, any way in which you can input there. There's a, a quote here from Flourish. Um, 
which says the same thing, which says without that processing we've just talked about, we end up carrying our unprocessed stories around with us and creating armor in the form of scripts, which can lead to blind spots or less openness to others' experience. And Sarah's just said that with the infant feeding uh, literature that, that she came across in her research. Reflecting well and with good structures and support allows us to integrate our own sto stories and see the scripts we have developed around them and move into a more conscious relationship with our lives and our work. And that's a rich opportunity for all of us in that time of change. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at resourcing ourselves and resourcing the midwives around us. And this uh, small steps graphic is from the book, but it's showing that, yes, we can't change everything, but we can take small steps which could make a big difference and sometimes these steps are really tiny and they begin with just asking the questions and you know grateful for all of you for being here tonight because you're already asking the questions just by being present and um we've got two slides with more questions more <laughs> possibilities here um and both of these also are going to be drawn into the chat so you can have more of a look at them and reflect on them um, and actually, some of you sitting there um, may be midwives who have had a baby um, or had a feeding journey, and you might have immediate answers to these as, as we talk about them. So what might have made a difference to in your pregnancy, first of all, in terms of processing your midwifery journey or your trauma? What would thoroughly emotionally supportive have looked like on your return to work? return to practice after maternity leave. And you might ask yourself, um, what are you discovering even now, even you know, many years on for some of you about how your own pregnancy or birth has shaped you as a midwife? So really interesting reflective questions. And then what, what extra support might you choose to seek out? If this is for uh, midwives who are becoming pregnant or want to become pregnant or preparing for a birth now what extra support might you need what might you ask for and in the current climate when we are you know struggling for staff and many units are actively lobbying to bring people on board these are the kind of questions you can ask in an interview you know what what are you doing for pregnant midwives who are exploring um, how to unravel their stories in preparation for their own birth and feeding journeys. And I know that might sound ridiculous, but it's true when we're in a, we're in a buyer's market, as it were, and it can create that kind of radicalized approach to, to seeking jobs because you're, you're really wanted out there. Um, what about designing a return to work, which is compassionate and trauma informed? And that might involve peers as well as midwifery leaders and PMAs and others. Um, what could we do collectively in terms of bringing together our wisdom and saying, what would a really quality return to work look like? And what else might we need? So we're going to throw that into the chat as well, so that you've got a chance mm -hmm. to continue to look at those. And um, isn't this true? It may not always feel like this, but actually vulnerability is our greatest strength and pregnancy as a time of anxiety and fear for many midwives, as we've seen in the small amount of research we have and birth itself, um, postnatal life, the early postnatal period in particular is a time of immense vulnerability and the return to work as a transition is enormous in parents' lives from a period of maternity or paternity leave. And this question is really helpful. What do I need, but I'm afraid to ask for in this moment? And that could be true for any of us. This is um, from the book. It's an adaptation from the book turned into a poster so that it's meant to be like a Sharps injury poster, poster so that we, we can become more aware through laminated posters of this kind in our sluices and on our corridors that trauma exposure requires a response just as a sharps injury requires a response and we need to know in advance what to do about it and how to get the support that we need so i'm just highlighting the parallel there between physical and emotional trauma um, and then that lovely image of midwives supporting each other 
sorry, just turning this off. Okay, fabulous. Now, where's now? <laughs> <laughs> Have we lost, lost Kate? Where's she gone? <laughs> <laughs> Come back, Kate. <clears throat> Gosh, is it, I think that's a huge um, number of questions to be asking. And I think what is um, useful, I think, for our audience to think about, and I know there's quite a lot of you out there, some of you may not have thought about this before. You might have thought of <clears throat> being a... Um, a midwife and a mum is kind of separate and you might have separated it in your brain. People have different ways of operating. Um, now we're waiting for Kate to turn herself around at the moment. Perfect. <laughs> um, so some of you, if you have questions, um, do, do, or if you have some answers, well, I think questions or answers, I think Kate and, and Sarah would be quite happy with, because I think this, and if, if correct me if I'm wrong, Kate and Sarah, but these are questions that they don't have a simple answer and they're going to be different. But for example, thinking about if you're pregnant now and you're going back as a midwife, these are quite good things to think about for coming back because it does change you having a baby. And being a midwife changes you becoming a mum. And maybe this, and, and I think from the, what I found very interesting from your, both your presentations is the kind of lack of evidence and research and attention, which kind of feels, you wonder, well, no, I won't be sexist and say if this was men, would there be more research? I don't know. That's a bit naughty of me. But I ha I'm now I'm going to look away just so the audience know. I look on the away because the screen with the questions and answers comes up on my side. So I've got uh, a comment from Diane Redoubt. Hi, Diane, who says, it's interesting you talk about midwives drawing on their own experiences. Those of us who have not had children utilise a wide variety of resources. And same with breastfeeding, we follow guidelines more strictly. I cannot agree. And there might, might be other midwives out there who'd say the same thing. Because we don't necessarily fit in neat packages, of course. Okay, so that's a comment on the question. And then April Marsh, hi April, says, when I was a pregnant as a midwife, I Googled pregnant midwife. Whoa. <laughs> because I was actively seeking support for my unique situation. I found nothing. It's given me a passion for supporting pregnant midwives. April, that's fantastic. I think you need to connect with Kate and Sarah for this. You've done maybe maybe this should maybe it become not just supporting pregnant midwives, maybe researching because it seems like there needs to be a lot more evidence. And April continues. Personally, I found the only way was to disengage from a lot of antenatal care. I found a community midwife who understood and did the bare minimum. In the end, I found the only way to protect my own birth was to free birth wow. wow any comments on that kate and sarah that's pretty whoa the yeah midwife. The, both claire feely and anna madeley in their research have have noted midwives not just making non-normative choices in terms of where they give birth but also to choose to free birth as part of that wow i so, personally um was induced with my son and I wanted to be induced on a birth centre. So I had telemetry monitoring with like-minded midwives and who would support me. Mm. Okay. Yeah, and research um, shows the small amount of research there is shows that midwives will often, you know, find their way through the system if they do stay in the system. And, and it's, it's to do with the level of trust makes sense with the midwives that used to be alongside. And often that's self-selected midwives and that's the only way they can remain in the system because they know they know too much about what's yeah. posing and will make them vulnerable. Yeah, absolutely. And that's I think it can either go one of two ways, can't it? It can make you more nervous because of what you've seen uh, in clinical practice because uh, what came out of the research was that one of the midwives who was a, a personal supervisor, one of the students, had actually opted for an elective cesarean because of what she's seen in practice. I think for me, it made me go the other way. I was a bit more blasé and 
almost wanted to turn the CTG off and decline the cesarean section and, and, and all those things. But yeah. And also I think it makes some staff members, they are more nervous to care for you when you're a midwife. Because and that's, of... that's an interesting thing you're saying, Sarah, because I, when you were talking, I was thinking I can remember working in the labour ward and, and being allocated a midwife to care to look after a midwife <clears throat> and everybody was saying oh it, it'll all go wrong it's all going to go wrong mm -hmm. she's a midwife what? yeah and, what is uh, oh, that... and and it's like the self-fulfilling prophecy isn't it because yeah. if you're looking for things to go wrong does that impact i wonder on the physiology of that woman mm -hmm. quite i mean this is a long time ago but i can remember that and you reminded me sarah so thank you for that that's my trauma okay I've... <laughs> Much more recently, I've heard that story around yeah. midwife. Um, uh, and yeah, it's mysterious where that's come from, but it's still there, that kind of questioning of, of what might go wrong for a midwife. Yeah. So that would impact on the midwives, maybe finding their different routes through. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. Well, I'm moving on from April. Thank you, April, for that. To Ashley. Ashley Wuh. Hi, Ashley, who says I had a negative experience of breastfeeding when I had my son and felt that I'd failed and was forced to artificially tr feed my son. I've made this a key part of my journey as a student to learn how to listen to concerns and provide better support to those who, who want to breastfeed. Well, well done you, Ashley. That's fan fantastic. That's, that's amazing. That's an example of not just healing, but growth as well, isn't it? integrating and then making the most of of your experience ashley fabulous it's lovely bit of feedback there excellent sophie hinsliff hi sophie says i remember working alongside the consultant who delivered my first baby assisted birth and quite traumatic it wasn't that i felt she'd done anything wrong but it was very odd having to disassociate from that disassociate from that relation from that experience in order to have a professional relationship with her now that's interesting kate because the, it's the interper per professional relationships which yeah. i'm not you know i don't know if you want to comment on that yeah i don't i don't know <clears throat> at all but it's very interesting isn't it what it means to have to be alongside people who've been alongside even in a tangential way but certainly if they've been alongside directly um, in your personal birth experience or your personal feeding journey. Mm. Challenging. Yeah. So I wonder if you'd, you'd have, I don't know if you'd have flashbacks whenever you worked with that person, if it was a really traumatic birth. Well, people report having flashbacks associated often with very visceral things like smells. So yeah. walking and it's smelling a certain way because of the cleaning fluid or the hibitane or something else yeah. so i'm sure that you know a, some a necklace that someone wears or a, a detail of what they look like would be the kind of thing that could provoke a flashback well even um seeing my case holding lady yesterday i suddenly you know having not thought about her for a long time suddenly remembered where she lived, what her house looked like, what her older son looked like, her child's names, you know, all suddenly came flooding back. And I think it does happen. So it's, it's a positive experience. That's <clears throat> quite comforting and nice. Yeah. If it's a negative one. It's probably shifting you off your, your pivot, isn't it? I guess. Very, very oh. difficult. What we need to be concerned about as well is, you know, students that probably did have a, a, a positive experience that they want to then bring forward as a midwife. Mm -hmm. Do they then try and fight for those physiological births when it's perhaps not suitable in that woman? So it could go either way. They could try and be too much of an advocate and actually be blindsided to what's going on around them. And we could end up with, with um, you know, a negative experience for that or a negative impact being declined analgesia or you know not seeing that things are going wrong so it could go either way so I think it's really important that we need to explore what these students have experienced and therefore how to support them moving forward and midwives going back into the system as well mm. that's a good that's a good point 
Okay, I'm moving. I've got it. I've got lots of comments here. We've got um, Sarah, Steph Carroll. Hi, Steph. It says, I remember a period of time where a number of midwives presented very late in labour after fear of coming in too soon and getting sent home and then missing fetal monitoring in second stage as, as a result. And then she carries on. I would love it if there was an additional support for midwives. I've been a midwife for 11 years and I'm several weeks weeks away from having my first baby. Oh, well done, Steph. Mm -hmm. How fabulous. Sometimes feeling pressure to be a good pregnant woman and deliver feed perfectly, which I think both of you alluded to, didn't you? Uh, Any words that... of wisdom for Steph? 11 that... weeks to go. <laughs> amazing Steph it's such an interesting phrase a good pregnant woman <laughs> and and the I mean I'm sure um every pregnant person will feel that to some extent am I doing the right thing am I doing what everyone else is doing but but for a midwife to have to feel that on top of thinking well I know so much so am I being a good pregnant woman inside a midwife's brain is particularly <laughs> challenging <laughs> and, and I think Gosh. the more Explore these um, dimensions the better of like yeah. separate elements of ourselves and that's one of the things that some reflective time in pregnancy would give mm. to an able to explore these things yeah I so definitely have... remember the pressure to breastfeed because I was a midwife and I'd advise so many women how to breastfeed and you know when it starts going wrong you think well I should be able to do it because I'm a midwife <laughs> and I know all about this and I've been telling people that you know this is what you do and when it comes to doing it yourself very, very, very different. You can almost feel your shoulders tensing, can't you, as you're saying, I should know how to do this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it happening? <laughs> Fabulous. And now I've got a comment from, so Steph, good luck for 11 weeks time. You will be a fantastic mum. You're a fantastic midwife. That's it. You do things your way. That's it. Now, I probably said the wrong thing because Kate might look a little disapproving, but I'm hoping that's the right thing. I hope I've been the, the good midwife too. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got Kelly, Kelly Thompson. Hi, Kelly, who said, oh, my goodness, I experienced trauma of a shoulder dystocia prior to becoming a midwife. This experience definitely guided my court choice of career. The one emergency I dread while on shift 20 years on. Mm. I think we all do, actually, don't we? But that would be. Yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, our experiences of secondary trauma as midwives will definitely have implications for how we see those emergencies and how we fear them, um, depending on how much support we've had at the time, of course, mm. but to have experienced it yourself. And I, I'd be curious as to whether, and you, you know, she may not want to answer this, but whether she, she got any support in that uh, education as a midwife directly around that that emergency and that mm -hmm. mo that time for her mm. yeah i think well, well she might come back on us come back if you'd like to kelly okay comment from maggie uh Dord Dordwiziak. becoming a mother certainly improved the care i gave to mothers i could actually understand what women were going through for following my own good personal births and breastfeeding experiences. I was very fortunate in choosing my midwives for both births. And you've illustrated beautifully, Maggie, several things. Thank you for that. And then I've got a comment from Catherine BK. As a first year student midwife and mother, I found it very helpful to be gently shown around the areas where I was experiencing my traumatic birth. This helped with processing my experiences following my birth reflection sessions and to prep for placement. Well, that's a really fantastic example to, sh to share, Catherine. Oh, we know Catherine is because that, that sounds like that unit, that placement site has really thought about how to introduce yeah. first year student midwives into practice mm -hmm. and to integrate their own personal experiences of birth so that it's not as dramatic as it would be otherwise. Yeah. And I suppose that comes as uh, when you're when you're booking, for example, you're getting to know the woman, reflecting if if they haven't had an opportunity to reflect after their birth, reflecting then. I mean, it's a really good time to kind of then unpack what's happened and maybe organise these sort of gentle walk, walks around the unit, for example. 
It is. Yeah. So, but a community midwife's got time to do that. I mean, most of the booking now is done over the phone, isn't it? So we're losing mm. a lot of communication that isn't that non-verbal communication. Um, it, it would be wonderful if if they could have that time to discuss their previous births. Yeah. But how quickly do we skim over the question? Well, maybe there are questions that we should spend more time on. Definitely. Oh, Sarah, that's, I think. Yeah. And and I've had feedback from Kelly. Thank you, Kelly, who says none. She didn't get a, any um, discussion after the, the birth and right. coming into midwifery. Yeah. So and remember that even though it's a long time ago and we know that women, we know from all the research that women remember their births for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, um, there can still be work done to support um, just just readdressing that that memory, gentle work, um, which can then support us in our practice to feel less fearful. But it's yeah, it's hard. Yeah. So, so Kelly, it's not too late because it, and it, there might be help that you can reflect back on. And I think one the, one of the key things out of this is about reflection for mothers after their births. A reflection for midwives before and after as well mm -hmm. and it it sort of makes me think because I, I, I was interested so when you talk about education because I know with one set of course that I ran with um pre-reg students we had a psychologist working with the group of students right from the start and it was incredibly effective for those students I think to to kind of unpack some of the reasons why they came into midwifery, but also help them through. But it's it, that's a huge resource again. But maybe, and I'm listening to both of you, it feels as though it's a really good investment, not just for the midwives and the workforce. And our midwives are very precious, very precious to us. And we need to look after them, but also for the women and the babies and the families that we're caring for. So... I think it would aid attrition rates in universities. I think if we definitely um, unpack some of their experiences so they're not so traumatised when they go mm. onto a maternity ward because it is very unpredictable and unexpected sometimes. It can have a huge effect on students. And students have left because of the trauma they've experienced. Mm. Yeah, and you're right, Sue. It does translate through to... Um, family's experience women and family's experience of of labor and birth in particular if a midwife's unable to kind of be fully present because of something that's going on for her it's it's different right mm. she feel, women and family feel that that's, well it and now i always say this hour is the fastest hour in the week for me and it's gone it's flown by really quickly and it's been fantastic because it's it's and I hope that those of you who are watching have had the same experience as me and that it's it feels it's a huge topic. There's not enough evidence and not enough research. So any researchers out there get working on it. And for those of you in education, think maybe think about different ways you could help students through it and maybe in practice, definitely in practice, think about your colleagues who are pregnant or have just had babies and how you can nurture them when they come back it's worth the investment because it's investment in self and others what could be better so i'll say a huge huge thank you to sarah and kate for joining us this evening it's been fantastic and this will be online at a later point and i, I suspect and i quite often say this to our speakers i suspect we might see you again because this topic is is so important and it's not going to go kind of magically sort itself out. We need to address it. We need to start answering some of these questions and moving, moving along. So for tonight, the resources will be available on the website. For those of you who are up at um, six o'clock in the morning on Friday, it'll be available then. Um, there'll be the last maternity and midwifery hour next week, next Wednesday, same place, same time, 7 to 8 on a Wednesday. Um, and we'll see you then. So in the meantime, stay safe and take care of yourselves and your loved ones. Give them an extra hug.